Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is the Stuart to my rolled... The eye candy. The, the eye hype can- machine. The one and only me. The squirrely Dan to my dairy. <laughs> the joint boy to my Tyson. Is Michael it, Walker. How you doing, Walker? Is that, is that what that means to you? I'm doing good, Mark. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you very much. So we're going to talk about board games today. We're going to talk about the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, The Aurus, which is what we reviewed last year. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. And our topic of the week is going to be whining. Whining. <laughs> Precisely. When it's appropriate, which is to say never. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of games encourage it, which is to say bad ones. <laughs> and how to be a better adult. So with that in mind, what did we review last year, Walker? We reviewed a game called Soul, Last Days of the Star, which is about a jazz singer at the end of her career, and you have to keep her fame up. No, we talked about fame last week. Oh. This is a... Easy mistake. (laughs) This is a really, actually, interesting game, and I wish I had played it more. It is this really cool where... uh, there's an orbit around and you have to sort of time when your buildings are going to come back around and you're trying to keep up with your your infrastructure or you're, you're you know, doing it properly and you're spacing out your infrastructure so you always have something to use and you're drilling down trying to get the last bit of energy from a dying sun so your people can escape. Very much like a huge ball of fire that is quite striking, but then fades its brilliance, then eventually burns out like a puff. I found Soul Last Days of a Star initially extremely compelling, and then every play I liked it less and less and less. I found it visually striking, and in terms of graphic design, I can't remember the last time I've played something quite so appealing as Soul Last Days of a Star. And so normally at this point, when I've traded a game away, which I did with Saul, I say, haven't thought about it in the year since... Uh, Saul, I have thought about in the years since, because again, it's, its presence was so undeniable that I, I wish the game came together a little bit better. I don't regret the plays that I had with the game, but it was a relatively straightforward, zero luck, perfect information puzzle game where experience would trump inexperience, and once you were behind, there was no way to catch up. And so it didn't hold my attention the way I would have liked to, but it was a nice ride. Yeah, it had a fantastic theme and it incorporated it very well. So people have been talking about whether or not there's going to be a reprint of Saul Last Days of a Star. Elephant Labs, the publisher of Saul Last Days of a Star, is going to be kickstarting a game called Organism. They say sometime in a couple seasons' time. It's tough to tell. They're not really done with the game yet, so they're not ready to launch the Kickstarter campaign. And when they do, a reprint for Saul will be part of that campaign. So it will see the light of day again, according to them. And when and if that happens, we will let you know. Wait, they're going to tag another game on with... With a different Kickstarter? Like, sort of, like, together? First time ever. That's weird. Never been done before. Almost we'll see like, how this works. Almost like a, like a catalog of their games that uh, they, it sounds that like they a, put my, out over and over I'm again. I'm sure with, Kickstarter will aggressively police its terms of service to prevent its platform from becoming a retail environment. Yeah, I'm sure they will. And so that is what we reviewed last year, Saw Last Days of a Star. Onward now to the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play last week? I played a lot of Root Online, Mark, and sort of the gear up, because this week we streamed Root on our Twitch, which we do every Saturday, and uh, I just enjoy Root every time I play it. I I keep asking the same question. I hear... I (laughs) aggressively will never choose to play it, for whatever reasons, but every time I get into a game of Root, I love it. That was not the question I was about to ask. The question that I always ask about the digital implementation, any time anyone says, yeah, I was playing Root Online with X, Y, or Z, I always ask, do they have all the factions yet? And the answer is no. I have a somewhat arbitrary policy. I'm not going to pay again for a game for less functionality. It was the reason why I didn't want to buy Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. You know, buying the game again with fewer factions. It's why I don't want to get the digital implementation of Root. Buy it again with fewer factions. And I like the new factions. We played When we played in person, I played as the underground duchy with the moles. I really like the moles. I think they're really cool. And in... If you want to run a balanced setup, there is only a small number of factions. This is not a serious limitation of, of, of Root. You still have 
marvelous variability in terms of setup and options in terms of the factions you can choose. But there's only a small number of factions that have what they call high reach. That's Cole Worley's term for something with an extended board presence. So some of my favorite factions are very low reach, like the Lizards are considered to have practically no reach at all, which is very appropriate. But at a very higher reach, you're talking mostly about three factions and three factions only. The Cats, the Eerie, and the Underground Duchy. And so if you take out the Underground Duchy, first of all, you lose out, I'd say, at least 12% of the game's cuteness. Yes. If not more. If not more. If not more. And then you're pretty much stuck with always having the cats or the birds in the, in the game, which is fine. But, you know, again, not something I'm willing to, 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 to rebuy again. But our playing was the Underground Duchy, the cats, and the Alliance, the Woodland Alliance. Alliance. Yeah. And it was a great time. I like Root with three. Some people don't play it with three. I prefer three than five because I find five drags a little bit. But I'm always happy to play a Root in pretty much any configuration. Yeah, for those who don't know, Root is a game where everyone plays a completely different faction whose powers are completely different than everyone else. Not only it's not just a different power, the whole play style and player board and everything's different. So not only is the playing of Root going to be different every time just to, you know, mechanics and how people play, but you get to, you know, change into these all these different kinds of animals and they have a totally different way plus style of play, which is almost an endless, you know, trove of gaming. Absolutely. And as I keep saying, when compared to other games that have tried a similar approach, cough, vast, cough, you still are all mostly playing by the same meta rules. You have a vague idea of how to mess with other people, and you all have some of the same victory conditions. And so it's not a case of A, playing a game against B, who's playing a game against C, where you don't really touch except for these weird corner case interactions, nor do you need to fully internalize the workings of all your opponent factions if you don't want to, because there's enough friction, there's enough presence on the board, there's enough commonality in terms of movement and battling that I think that Root can come together at almost any level of skill if you're ready for that density of of rules and one of the reasons why i think it has staying power as opposed to a lot of the other heavily asymmetric games which sometimes can come off as a bit of a novelty act and that's root by cole Worley and put out by leader games can't wait for oath I tried a game called Hard City. A Hard City is by adam kupinski and merrick Ruchinski. i apologize for the mispronunciations at Hexy Studio. This was put out last year. This was a Kickstarter. This is a 1v all, as Walker would say, buckets of plastic type thing. This was recommended by a listener, and the appeal of the game was that it seemed to be kind of halfway between a Blacklist Games type brawl and the stru- most slightly more structured setup of something like Hellboy, because there are these phased events that happen in a certain order that are set up very simply over the course of a deck. There are these headline cards that produce little cutscenes, And those are scenario-specific. And there's also this very simple board setup of very, very big squares, so you're not about running from point A to point B. It's a relatively stable map setup. And I have to say that the action selection mechanism is pretty decent as well. Every It's a heavily stylized reimagining of 1980s police uh, police action filtered through neon and mutants a la the uh, trauma movies, if you're at all familiar with that kind of aesthetic. Although slightly more uh, G-rated than a lot of trauma movies. And every cop, when they activate, gets five actions, and the way that you juice up actions is by spending more actions after the results happen. So you roll the dice, and you get a conditional success. Well, that can either be a failure, or it can be a success if you want to spend an additional action after the fact to turn it into a success. And I, I quite like that flexibility in terms of selecting different actions. It was, it, so it comes in two different modes. You can either play cooperatively or 1v all. I tried it solo, so I tried it the cooperative way. And that's the AI was okay. It was it was all right. But I wonder if the 1v all version is going to be better because that's very much how it was presented. The solo and co-op version is presented as a variant. It uses a different deck of cards. And the rules are presented after the fact. And so very much like when you're looking at a, a, a frozen type confection or treat, I always see, seek to prepare it based on what is presented first. If it says conventional oven first and then microwave, I will always prefer the conventional oven. But if it says microwave first, I'll try it in the microwave first. It's just, it's a bias I have, and it extends to board games. Hot Pockets and games are fundamentally the same thing. You heard it here first. Well, the designer knows, right? The designer of the Hot Pocket. If he thinks that, you know, microwaving is a better idea, then, you know, then you go with what he, you know, he's the one that made it. I, I, it's tough to tell. I, 
As we've commented before, the editor of a board game or the person writing the rulebook to the board game isn't necessarily the designer any more than the food scientist who crafted up the Hot Pocket is the one who's producing what's on the box. So (laughs) I'm willing to admit that this is a sometimes irrational bias. But nonetheless, Hard City was cool. I wish it had leaned into its aesthetic aesthetic a little bit more. So when you look at the front of the box, what you get is the title of the game, Hard City, is in this bright neon pink. But the rest of the graphic design of the front cover is a little bit more staid, a little bit more traditional pedestrian, you know, dark muted colors, things like that. I was hoping that it was going to lean into the sort of 80s ridiculous color vibe. I didn't want it necessarily to look like the Top Gun game. Precisely, but I did appreciate that what the Top Gun game was doing with its color palette was evoking a particular kind of style and aesthetic. And as a result, I didn't get the the sort of wacky zany universe that was that was that was promised in the sort of copy text of Hard City. So minor quibble on the graphic design there. It was kind of zany. I, I wish it leaned into it a little bit more because again, this is a crowded market of the co-op or one be all type of miniatures fest. And if you're going to differentiate yourself aesthetically then differentiate yourself aesthetically and I, I i wish they'd done a little bit more of that so i'm interested in trying hard city a little bit more i didn't quite enjoy it as much as the two different games that i compared it to namely the blacklist games particularly street masters or hellboy but it was quick it was simple it was enjoyable the scenario setup appears to provide a su- substantial degree of difference from session to session which is always for the good And although it was a Kickstarter, one doesn't get the impression when opening up the box that you basically got half a game and that the other half was entirely through stretch goals. So when and if I have the opportunity to try Hard City in the 1v all mode, I can see if that does feel like sort of the original mode. Or if perhaps this is another opportunity for a 1v all game to have the quote unquote bad guy basically be a dungeon master and not engage in interesting gameplay in and of itself. Time will tell. And that was my first experience with Hard City. You got to introduce me to Tejudo, a Reiner Knizia game put out by Super Meeple. This is a game that's based around drawing buildings out of a bag. And there are like eight different colors. And you're building, what was it, seven levels of a building? Six. Six levels of these temples. And then you're doing this in order to get some currency that are going to give you these bonuses that help you get currency or discount your buildings or let you buy victory points. But it's all pretty well centered around these buildings, either putting on levels or putting on cubes on the levels. And it all comes down to timing and a lot of luck, I felt, about near the end. You know, you really want to get your cubes out at the end, or maybe because I just got greedy and waited to the end while the other players, you know, got rid of their cubes early, whereas I was stubborn and wanted to get the most out of my cubes, so I waited towards the end and therefore lost the opportunity to put out cubes because if the building's finished, then that color of the cube is, well, you don't get to place it. In all, I thought it was a fairly good game. I don't think I'll ever choose to play it. It seemed like a little luck-driven to me because of, you know, worrying about the colors you're going to get out. It could be almost anything, and you really can't plan out very well, I felt. Huh, it's weird. I felt that in our playing, actually, of Tejudo, the luck element was very minimal. Because Not the size, the color. Right, but the in instances where you are trying to capitalize on a specific color, it's typically because, as you say, you've just given up on the timing entirely. There were many rounds where if you wanted to put a cube on a level 3 building, you could go ahead and do that, and all of the buildings were at level 3, so you could pull a level 4 tile and be sure that you could build it right away. And even if you pull something that you can't build, as I did once during that session, which was far less than the first time we played. The first time we played, there was a lot more risk involved of, well, this building needs a level 5, this one needs a 4, these other need a 2, and what do I take? What do I want built built when? Like a lot of games of itself, I think Tejudo is a lot about timing, as you say, and you held onto your cubes for the end. I don't know why. And as a result, yeah, your cubes couldn't be played. Well, because I wanted the most money out of my cubes. I didn't want to throw away on just three. I wanted to get, you know, seven to eight. Why get three when you get from seven to eight marks? That's how Because I'm... you didn't get seven to eight, Walker. Well, zero is another number. <laughs> zero not is a another good number. number. But it is a number. Tejudo is not Reiner Knizia's best. I will absolutely agree. I thought it was perfectly pleasant. I enjoy the tactile element of building up the pagodas. I'm still nervous about the theme. I don't like uh, gamifying religious practice. I don't like the fact that you're trading in enlightenment points, and that's just silly and absurd. 
but I do enjoy the aspect of trying to figure out which temple is going to be finished. One of the more remunerative tiles that you can purchase in terms of points are tiles that are worth nothing if the temple hasn't been finished, and worth four points if the temple has been finished. Only four temples will finish over the course of the game. That part is neat. Uh, Unfortunately, there was no pressure on me. There was no competition with respect to those because the other two players just didn't buy any of them. And so I was in a position a couple times of buying the tile when it was obvious that it was going to score, so there's no risk involved. The other two players were new to the game and probably, I think... After you bought the first one, we both realized that, oh, yes, there's tiles there as well. <laughs> and then... Sure, sure. But the first time I played was also all with new players, and there was a, it, it felt a lot tighter. I don't know why. Maybe it's just a function of what people decided to do and what risks people decided to take. But ultimately, I think that in terms of, of games of timing, that's just often the kind of trade-offs that you need to make. So I agree with you that to judo isn't Knizia's best. I'm sorry you didn't enjoy it too much. But I think that even a mediocre Reiner Knizia design is, is still eminently worth people's time. So I do not regret having played to judo. I'm just going to transition right into the next one, which is Medici, which is a fantastic Reiner Knizia game. This is put out. This particular one, when I was looking into this, this particular one was put out by. Sorry, the newest one is put out by Migo. Yes, I'm not sure which one we played. Well, it's been republished because many times. exactly because the number of different versions I saw online today. Oh yes, is, absolutely is ridiculous. So it has been more or less continuously in print since 1995. So I'm not sure if Mark has the same vibe, but this game gives that skull feel to me. It's getting down to that vital first bid. What you're doing is you're 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 flipping up some cards, and you're it's a one time around bidding system. So establishing establishing that first number is very key and can set the you know the 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 sort of vibe for that round of of bidding. The vibe that I get from Medici and this is what I've always had is that it feels to me like the first draft of raw. This feels to me like the rough, unfinished, not quite as refined, not as good version of Raw. Because Reiner Knizia auction games, although always satisfying, I've yet to play an unsatisfying Reiner Knizia auction game, with the possible exception of Llama, if you want to call Llama an auction, which arguably you could if you were so inclined. So, okay, so to back up. Every game is an auction game, Mark. Yeah. So the so-called Reiner Knizia auction trilogy was is uh, 1992's Modern Art, 1995's Medici, and 1999's Raw. And I think that Modern Art is still a worthy entrant. When I play Modern Art, I don't think, oh, well, this just feels like an er- r- earlier version of Raw. But when I play Medici, I think, eh. Because you have the once-around auction system. You have this idea of pushing your luck and putting out a flop of cards that may be better for some people than others. It's about deciding when to stop offering cards because strategically offering a single card for auction or two cards up for auction when you could offer three is more advantageous. It's about sometimes being the last person left and then just getting randomly whatever the the, the deck gives you. But I think that all of these ideas are implemented better in Raw. I think the tempo is better. I think the timing is better. Part of it is, and this is just a personal preference, I tend to be less good at auction games that involve you bidding in victory points. Because in Medici, it's all about currency. So whatever you use to buy is is points off the top and then you get points in terms of money from what you've purchased at the at the end of the round. So uh, Medici is absolutely a classic, but the things that it does that are interesting to me are more interestingly done in Raw. And that is one of the reasons why I find it frustratingly and unsatisfying because of how similar it is to a game that I personally find superior. There are a lot of people still prefer Medici. I will absolutely say that at five or six, Medici is a better bet, probably, because with six, you cannot play Raw. And at five, Raw is starts to become a very particularly strange experience. I still like Raw at five, but it starts to get very chaotic in a very particular kind of way. How about the timing it takes? To, I think Medici would be played off much quicker than Raw would. I don't know about much quicker. It is faster, but I don't think it's it's sufficient enough. We're talking about the difference between, you know, 45 to 60 minutes versus 50 to 75. Okay. In my experience, anyway, of, of playing those games. And that is Reiner Knizia's Medici. Walker introduced me to the search for Planet X because it's been about, oh, I don't know, 20 years since I've had to study for a standardized test. 
And so if you enjoy the prospect of doing Sudoku in a group where everyone's just staring at their phones, let me tell you, the Search for Planet X is for you. Because one of the things that I hate about your traditional Euro game, especially some of your more modern stuff, or even some of the classics like Medici, is all that pesky player interaction. You know, that notion where we're all competing on the same board, or possibly I, I, I pay you money as a bid, or possibly the card I take is one that you could possibly also get, I find that very unpleasant. I find that actually making eye contact with friends is also deeply unsettling Mark, isn't in it a number hard, of ways. isn't it hard enough to get together in the first place? Now you want the game to like go through the effort of making us interact with each other? I think you're just asking too much. That's a good point. I... I We really have to appreciate a board game that says, you know what people really want to do is stare at their phones in the same room with each other for a while. How to simulate a failing marriage, in other words. That's what I think A Search for Planet X does really, really well. Wow. (laughs) All right. So, Search for Planet X. I'm only half joking. (laughs) Search for Planet X is you are searching the night sky to find these hidden planets and maybe, uh, and this is what astronomers actually do. They look out into space. They see uh, rocks and asteroids that are behaving oddly, or how light reflects. Sorry, ref- reflects, 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 or refracts, refracts, refracts oddly in certain pieces of space. And they use this information to to make inferences, hypothesize there might be a planet there. And this is what. And this is what, you know, this game does, you know, uses, gives you a bunch of clues and you sort of have to puzzle out where Planet X is. This game is my jam. Not, sorry, that is a complete misspeak. This type of puzzle is ah, my jam. Okay. The gaming part of this is is garbage. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> right? This moving around the board and this timing, like... I was trying to think, you know, why did they do this? But it makes sense, right? Because you want to have just parts of the night sky available, right? So you have to sort of limit the board and how the timing works to introduce where you're going to, you know, get victory points. Because there's not a lot of these games that are competitive. They're usually always cooperative, right? So so anytime you have any sort of scoring in these things, it's it's difficult. And that's why they need this timing element. Anyway... The times that I did it solo, I just took that whole part out, and I just, you know, timed how quickly I could figure out the puzzle. I just love this kind of, it's very much, you know, like uh, incognito, if that's not this and this is not that. You can eliminate, you know, 30 things and then, you know, funnel it down into what you need to know. I really like this type of game. So, uh, just to circle back to my somewhat thinly stated or, or, or subtle criticism of the game... When compared to a game like Sleuth or like Incognito or even games like Cryptid or Tobago, for example, which are similar kinds of inference slash deduction slash puzzle solving games, uh, The Search for Planet X, especially the way that it integrates its app implementation, just really leans into the multiplayer solitaire hardcore in a way that I find very unsatisfying. It's so it, it's really strange to have an app-based game where everyone is running your own version of the app and it doesn't even lead you through the game. You just ping it for various points of information. And I'm not concerned about people cheating, but it is sufficiently does a sufficiently poor job of shepherding you through the game experience that there's absolutely nothing to stop someone from fundamentally misunderstanding the rules and just clicking all the information at once and then going off to town. It's just a way to parcel out the clues, and in so doing, it just pulled me out of the experience of playing a board game. I really felt like I was getting all the social value of just filling out a Sudoku by myself. Not that I do that kind of thing, because, and this is the other part, I have never really enjoyed those... Sally, Jenny, and Jerome each have a sweater. One of them is brown, one of them is not green, and the other one contains stripes. On a sunny day, they tend to try to wear blah, 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 and you fill out these grids. Had to do that for various preps for very standardized tests. Didn't enjoy them then, don't enjoy them now. But it's definitely some people's jam, and I respect that it is yours. But given that it is your jam, wouldn't you rather play something where there was a little more player interaction? Oh, 100%. Okay. But there's not much out there that is, you know, has some sort of a theme and is you know, gives you the information where you're not accidentally reading something you're not supposed to or having to fiddle around with cards. I feel the app does a nice job. Like, especially, like I said, I started doing the solo and, like, counting out spaces, and it was like, okay, that's, that's, this is silly garbage. And then I just sort of, you know, did the puzzle on my own. What also rankles me a bit, and after this I'll have a question for you, is that 
you're still staring at the phone, but at the, sa- at the end of the day, you still have to do paperwork. So you're you're managing what's going on on the app, but at the same time, you have to scribble notes all over your yeah, sheet. Yeah, but it's so fun paperwork. Look, you can enjoy the paperwork or not. I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the functionality of the app seems to be so minimal, and the social experience is undermined considerably by its presence and by the oh, games yeah, for sure. on it. Look at me, like no interaction, and yeah. like you said, pulls everyone out. And the fact that we've had segments where we talk about how people should never be looking at their phone while they're playing games to keep, you know, keep them in the moment. And this is just doing the opposite. I have a final question though. And that is at the early parts of the game, there is a series of six clues that everyone will get access to. They all have the same categories, but the specific clue that they get will vary from game session to game session. The rule is you cannot ping for a clue twice in a row. And so the early part of the game that we played it was all the same. Ping for clue, do something else. Ping for clue, do something else. Ping for clue. Until we had all pinged all our clues because getting those first six clues are the obvious first thing, six things you want to do. And so again, it was just the structure of the game parceling out this information at an arbitrarily slow rate just so there could be a game. Has that been the pattern in your other sessions? Yes, for sure. Well, that's unfortunate. But that is the beginner game. If you go into the advanced game, then you get none of those clues, and it's all just sort of asking questions about what's in the grids. Okay. That's good to know. I, I If I were more inclined towards these kinds of puzzles, then maybe the advanced game is more what I'd be looking for. I'd be willing to give that a try. And this had, what, nine sectors? You can flip the board over and has 18 sectors. I haven't tried that yet. Looking forward to trying that. Super wild. We got to play Alexander Pfister's Blackout Hong Kong again, and... Uh, This is the second time I've played it, and it's just revealing that there is more there. The fact that it has this very interesting action action selection where you're putting the cards down, and there's almost a whole mini-game there. There is definitely strategy of where to put those cards. It's not just these are the three actions I want to do, you throw them down. There is a distinct advantage of putting them in certain places, not only to get certain color combinations, but in order how quickly you're going to get them back and how long they're going to be sitting there. There's all sorts of different, like I just said, it's a little mini game in on itself. And then all sorts of other stuff. It's just, it's just getting better and better every time I play it. I really like the theme. I just like to say I've, I've had mild to moderate misgivings about all of Alexander Fister's other games, partially by virtue of, of, of theme. I really like Blackout Hong Kong's theme. All the people that you recruit, all the objectives that you pick up are these cool kind of contextually relevant things. And it feels vaguely cooperative, even though it really isn't. And I really appreciate that. I think that that's kind of neat. And it feeds into an overall graphic design that helps sell the overall narrative. And that I think is one of the reasons why it's my favorite Fister. I, 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 I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of Blackout Hong Kong, but I enjoy it, and I'd happily play it when anyone suggests it. There's this very complicated throughput of managing your objectives, because you can't be too conservative, which is typically my failing, and at the same time, you have to be conscious of being able to satisfy your objectives at a steady rate, despite the fact that your influx of resources might be somewhat random. And so you have to be very, very cautious, but at the same time, bold when necessary. I am not a huge fan of how the game scales. We played with three this time as opposed to a full complement of four, and the board felt way too open. As a result, we were all just playing this cool minigame with our cards, and it's a great compelling minigame. The throughput of cards is usually an Alexander Fister strong point, and it's no exception here in Blackout Hong Kong. That part is great, but that part does not interact with the other players at all. It's the, the the point of commonality is dealing with the districts on the board, and we didn't really run into each other. There was a single instance this last time we played where somebody completed a district and anybody else was even remotely there. Uh, so that's the only knock that I'd have against it. Probably best at max player count, and I agree with you that the, 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 the card puzzling is great, and I'm a big fan of how it manages the semi-random influx of resources. Blackout Hong Kong is really good. Yeah, the resources. That's something to talk about quickly as well. The resource thing, I've never seen this in any other game, is the fact that you have this, because usually it's like a sort of a deck builder, and you said, oh, I really want wood, so you get a lot of wood cards. Well, it doesn't work that that way in this game. You're getting three different colors, either blue, yellow, or red, and uh, you roll dice to see what resources that those colors are going to represent. So that's going to tell you what is going to be available this turn. And it's very interesting because not only are you, you know, uh, drafting or purchasing or uh, whatever you want to say, getting cards for 
uh, resource generation, but it also allows you to put cubes on the map. So you're seeing what colors they're going to give you as a reward. You know, what sort of resources do they take to, you know, get out? It's all sorts of interesting things. It's revealing more and more every time. And like Mark said, it's not, I'm not, I don't want to like sound like I'm gushing like this is the greatest game ever, but it's it sort of, it's very interesting for the lack of buzz that it, it's getting now. Yeah, it's a really interesting, solid, compelling middleweight Euro game. And I agree with you. The, the, the variety of different objectives that you can choose to get, because the, the basic the basic life cycle of a card is it comes out in the random tableau, you purchase it, it goes onto your board, you then at a future time satisfy its requirements by paying some combination of resources, and only then does it either go into your hand or go to the top of your board case depending. And so why you might choose to purchase a given card might be, well, I have the resources available to satisfy it, so why not? It might be, it generates a kind of action that I really want to perform. It might be, it generates a kind of resource production that will really help me satisfy other objectives later on down the line. Uh, all the way down to, hey, it was super cheap and I had room. <laughs> might as well get grab it. Or the picture looked really cool. Or the picture looked really cool. Although I think the coolest picture is definitely the leader of the Tiger group. That I think uh, cannot be denied. But anyway, I agree with you. And those kinds of trade-offs are really neat. And that is even before you have to worry about the card cycling that you're talking about in terms of playing them out to these columns and the various color combinations. It's really clever. I like it. And that was Blackout Hong Kong by Alexander Pfister and Egert Spiel. As threatened, I played another game of The Shores of Tripoli. The Shores of Tripoli is a very light historical war game about the First Barbary War, put up by Kevin Bertram at Fort Circle Games. This is a review copy sent to us by the publisher, and I enjoyed my uh, first playing with Walker. And I was a little bit curious about how the solo game would work, and I was also a little bit curious about the extent to which the game would feel on rails. Because, like your good card-driven historical war games, all the victory conditions and all the historical detail are offloaded onto cards. And most of the cards that get you towards victory, either as the Americans taking Tripoli or setting up a condition where the Tripolitanians will sue for peace, are offloaded onto very specific cards that say, you cannot play this card before the fourth round of the game. So then the question is, are you just going to tread water for the first four rounds and then the game actually starts? And the answer is kind of, but not really, and I'm okay with it. Because, again, given that the game lasts about 45 to 60 minutes, I'm willing to tolerate the fact that you're going to see wild swings of dice. I'm willing to tolerate the fact that you're more or less treading water in terms of victory conditions because the cut and thrust and the risk-reward playing as the Americans, even though you can't push for your victory conditions yet, is nonetheless interesting because you have to worry about softening up the terrain for a ground invasion. But at the same time, you can't leave your flank exposed to piracy because that's how the Tripolitanians win. At the same time, you need to worry about using your frigates to maximum efficiency, but at the same time, you can't worry about losing any of your, your forces because that's another Tripolitanian victory condition. And that part is really neat. I really enjoyed it. The AI is really quite interesting. It sets up this queue of events and you basically go from left to right. You you trigger the first thing that can satisfy and then that card goes away. And if none of them satisfy, well then you pull a card off of off of the, 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 the same two player deck that you would use in normal play and you consult the rule book to see if the conditions are met. And what you get very much like a more complicated two- to four-hour card-driven war game, is the same kind of matrix of decision-making, but in a very, very quick package. Now, if the game had sought to sprawl a little bit further, sought to have a little bit more detail, a little bit more texture, I think the system would have collapsed under that weight. Yeah, the the, the simplistic dice system, I think, would have failed in that instance. And I, I, I want just to touch on the part that the slow build at the beginning works in two ways. One, when you're introducing a new player to it, it sort of lets them figure out exactly what's going to go on, and then you can reintroduce the victory conditions a second time, because now they'll make more sense. It's like, okay, now you know this is how you're going to win again it's like now they can understand how it's going to work and like i said even if you played it before it just sort of reintroduces you so so it's oh yeah okay now i remember and gets you back into it so it's not heavy decisions right off the beginning that are going to you know skew the game and i did see a little bit more variety in terms of how the end game was going to shape up based on some of the decisions and some of the events that happened in the earlier turns. Like, for example, is Tripoli going to get a frigate? If they get a frigate, then the game changes. Not fundamentally, but in terms of the overall decisions the Americans might make in terms of how they're going to press for victory. Are the Swedes going to enter the game? Because that, too, influences things. How much raiding are you going to get done successfully before the military confrontation starts to get really real? I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think that the Shores of Tripoli has a more staying power than I feared. 
I do think that the uh, some of the card play is a little bit let down by the battle system. More or less what happens is you throw a fistful of dice and you're looking for sixes. And so some of the battle cards that add somewhere around three-ish dice to your result, eh, I mean, three dice when you're looking for six is not a huge deal most of the time. And so some of those start to feel a little bit like filler cards. And in a game where you only have a, 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 about 25 cards in your deck, filler cards are, are, are a little bit unfortunate and a little bit disappointing. And it is definitely disappointing in a huge battle to get all your frigates together, expend a significant amount of energy to get that 13 die pitch and not roll any sixes, which is not terribly aberrant. And it happens. Walker raised his hand. Yep. <laughs> now, the solo, are you allowed to play either side, or can you only play the Only Americans? the Americans only against the, the Americans. Tripolitanians, and that's okay. a little unfortunate as well. I have So I've now... N- I have yet to play as the Triple Atanians. I'm looking forward to giving that a shot because the sort of opportunistic profiteering that is the style of play of the Triple Atanians seems like something that would appeal to me. But I do have to emphasize again how beautiful the production is. It's an absolutely lovely game, and I'm looking forward to more experiences with the Shores of Tripoli. We got to play a very interesting game called Shadows Amsterdam, which is sort of like this hybrid code names, Mysterium, real time game. Pathing, yeah. kind of. So there's all these sort of Dixit, you know, Mysterium picture hexes that are laid out, and everyone has sort of like a. And there's two masters, each have like a code name sort of card that tells them where the good space is and where the bad space is. And then you get a hand of cards or there's a big draft of cards and you're flinging cards at your <laughs> at your partner. Uh, you know, one card if you want them to move one space, two cards if you want to move them two spaces away. And they need to use these cards to figure out what space you're trying, you're referring to. And it's fairly interesting. It's kind of really difficult, I guess, for our team, it seemed very difficult. <laughs> for the other team, not so difficult. But, uh, like, trying to get someone to guess a pitcher by just giving them one card, it, it was a little... Uh, it, I, I enjoyed it a lot, but it was very difficult. I really liked the conceit, but I don't know that it came together in a way that I found particularly satisfying. First of all, uh, some confusion as to the theme. There's, It's all these anthropomorphic animals in Amsterdam... And the player pawns are these small mammals on on Vespa style scooters running around the city. In the scenes of these various vignettes. I don't know why it's called Shadows Colon Amsterdam. There's some confusion as to what it was called, even by the person who owned the game. Sidewinder introduced the game to us, and she was like, "I think it's Shadows over Amsterdam, or is it Amsterdam Shadows?" Or she would sometimes call it just Shadows, or just Amsterdam. It is Shadows Colon Amsterdam. Well, maybe they had planned to put out a bunch, yeah, possibly, you know, different cities. Not that it, I, look, I've never been to Amsterdam. Do you know what they put their, uh, put on fries there instead of ketchup? Mayonnaise. I, I've seen them do it. I, I've watched They drown it. them in that stuff. You can get a beer at McDonald's. I know. I'm not talking about a paper cup. I'm talking about a glass of beer. Anyway, I don't, it, it didn't seem particularly Amsterdam-y. Um, so he, here's the thing, though. Unlike in code names, where you're just drawing an association between a word and a word, or Mysterium, where you're drawing an association between one type of picture and a different kind of picture... In Shadows Amsterdam, you have a spatial element on top of all this, and that part intrigued me, but ultimately I felt that the association element and the spatial element did not cohere in a satisfying way. And I think it was actually our team's realization that you should ignore the association element, because you're really good at making associations between different kinds of pictures. Uh, Very often you're very good at getting on the wavelength of your partner, but even when you're not, you're able to point out similarities and deep similarities that I would never, ever observe. And I saw you trying to play the game as intended. And I think that what quickly happened was uh, our team made the decision to not play as intended or at least not play the same way you were because you either hand, uh, as the clue giver, you hand your partner or team, because you can play in teams. We played with four, so two teams of two, one or two cards. If you hand them one card, that means you're trying to get them to move one space away. If you hand them two cards, that means that they move two spaces away. So unlike in Mysterium, if I hand you three cards in Mysterium, you know that I wanted you to have those three cards. And those three pictures mattered. If I hand you two pictures in Shadows Amsterdam, maybe one of the pictures is relevant. Maybe they're both relevant. Maybe neither of them are relevant, and I'm just telling you to move. And so very quickly, I would get the, you know, look at these pictures that I would have and look at the pictures on the board, see no association with them whatsoever and figure, okay, this is a root pathing game. This is a root connection game now. I don't 
know what these mean. I've just been told to move two spaces. Might as well give it a shot because it's real time. So you were playing minefield. I was playing minefield. Exactly. I was playing a real time minefield and you were trying to play a real time Mysterium. And I think that was that was the difference of the game. I wanted it to co- cohere. I thought that part would be cool, where the pathing elements would inform the visual association. But really, I felt they were working at cross purposes because you have to make the decision about how many cards to hand somebody. That's the primary decision as a clue giver, at least from my perspective, and from talking it over with Sidewinder, who's played a fair number of times more than, more than we have. You decide where they want to go. And that's primarily decided by space, and that informs how many cards you hand them, and then you kind of, sort of, try to find pictures that fit, so. And that was our playing of Shadows Amsterdam, designed by Matthew Albert, published by Le Bon? Le Libelud. Libelud. Matthew Albert's pseudonym is probably Matthew Albert. That might be how he's referred to when he's on the lamb. There you go. Did you get it? Anthropomorphic animals? Yeah, on, on the, the lamb. Yeah. yeah. Glad you liked that. It was great. And lastly, I talked about Nadavalier last week and how well it plays on on uh, Board Game Arena and the fact that you can sort of quickly pick up where you were because you can just see your you know what you're collecting and, and pick the card you want and move on. And I found that Dice Forge does much the same thing because in Dice Forge, you know, you're collecting resources on everyone's turn sort of to keep you in the game because interaction. <laughs> so in the real game, you know, the, the active player rolls the dice and or everyone rolls their dice and you get resources, but you don't get to do anything it's, until it's your turn. So you're collecting resources. So it works nice on Board Game Arena because you just, it automatically rolls the dice and when it's your turn, you've collected all your resources and you decide what card you're going to buy or change your die and then and then off you go and you wait and then it'll be your turn again. So I just want to point out that it works very well in Board Game Arena and the implementation is very good and check it out. And those are the games we played this week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Joseph McCullough, author of Frostgrave and Rangers of Shadowdeep, two very successful tabletop miniatures rule systems, is going to be coming out with a new solo slash co-op miniatures game rule set called Silver Bayonet, which is a 28 millimeter, definitely my jam, game of Napoleonics, absolutely my jam, confronting nightmarish old one Lovecraftian monsters, sometimes my jam. And I was initially very excited about this because 28 millimeter Napoleonics is not a thing you do very much. It's not a very common thing. It's hard to do. Uh, They tried to do a a 28 mil Napoleonic rule set in the Song of Blades and Heroes system, which was kind of successful. Is this like a true 28 or Games Workshop 28 that's really 35? <laughs> uh, no, Games Workshop is not in 28 mil. It's in heroic scale. Oh, sorry, sorry. My mistake. With your Games Workshop, you just get to break rules and, and you get away with it. But then I remembered, this is Joseph McCulloch, who who absolutely can make a setting, absolutely can come up with some some good scenario design, but he is married to a combat resolution system that I absolutely loathe. And I've been playing a lot of Rangers of Shadowdeep, which I still enjoy with the Houndwerker, but the combat resolution system is just garbage. It's, I just, it's really not for me. I roll a d20 and add my fight score of 4 because I'm a highly elite soldier. The rat rolls a d20 with a modifier of 0 because it's useless, and the rat does 10 damage to me. Because that's just the way D20s work, and I've got, I'm nothing against D20s, but when we're talking about opposed D20s, and lifetime of training gets you four, which is a margin of 20% over the rat, uh, and it's not, yeah, you can game it out, and you can absolutely get the modifiers to your favor. I'm not complaining about the difficulty of putting down a rat, because I've, I've, I've killed my share of rats in Rangers of Shadowdeep. I just don't find it an interesting system. And there are things you can do with D20s. Infinity is a D20 system that I think is much, much better, and I've just been spoiled by the miniatures game systems of Roby Jenkins, because Roby Jenkins, as a game designer, identifies as somebody who cares about resolution mechanisms. He's like, I'm going to have an interesting resolution mechanism at the core of each of my games, and that's absolutely what I'm in the mood for. So uh, if you're you're okay with other resolution mechanisms that that Joseph McAuliffe had done, if you disagree with me that they're kind of unsatisfying, and you find the the setting appealing, as I do, uh, keep a lookout for Silver Bayonet. It's going to be released by Osprey Games later on in the year. On the topic of solo co-op tabletop miniatures rule set, Blacklist Games is getting involved in this. I've talked about this before, but it's going to be hitting Kickstarter tomorrow at the time of recording, so probably by the time you hear this episode, it'll be up on Kickstarter. It's called Blasting Tales. It is a book of rules, along with a campaign for their second series of fantasy miniatures, but that's optional. So very much like a couple of other campaigns they've done, uh, specifically... 
most recently the one they did for Dire Alliance, where you could buy the game without miniatures, or you could buy the miniatures, or you could buy the game with miniatures. They're going to be doing the same thing with Lasting Tales. Lasting Tales seeks to be a sort of tabletop minis game version of Dungeons & Dragons-esque. You can pick from five different races and ten different classes and do the whole thing. I haven't done a deep dive into, again, the resolution mechanisms, because that's kind of one of the things that often trips up tabletop miniatures uh, wargaming as far as I'm concerned. But I find it interesting that a company that has been producing board games is now getting into the tabletop miniatures wargame rule writing business. This is a new designer that hasn't worked with them before, but uh, nonetheless, I'll be taking a look at Lasting Tales. All of my news is podcast-related. If you want to tell us what game you want us to review or talk about anything about the podcast, if you want to have a suggestion or make a comment, come to our guild on Board Game Geek, guild number 3236, because that's the one we try to read most often. We do look at all the others, but this is where we try to consolidate everything together. And like I talked about before, we did Root this week on Twitch. The video for it is also up on YouTube, so if you want to check it out, it's there to see. And soon on Twitch, we're planning to do, I guess, I don't know, the, the, the easiest way to talk about it would be a mini podcast, I guess. We're going to be talking about the, the feature game of the week, but we're going to be doing it live so everyone can take part and comment and ask questions while we rehash the game we talked about that week. Any comments on that or any suggestions? Like I said, see you in the guild. I want to call your attention to a very strange Kickstarter project uh, launched by uh, Thomas Wells, who's someone we met at Shucks in point of fact. Uh, it's called Lot, and it is a bespoke game where every copy will come with the same set of cards, and then I'm going to say tokens. Well, I'm, I'm, I have a feeling, Mark, that, that he was maybe going down some stairs <laughs> or maybe some 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 storage receptacles got shaken up, so it's, he dips into like this vast different board game components. Every game will come with a certain amount of components, and there are all sorts of different. Every game will be unique. Yes, uh, unlike that atrocious fantasy flight game, Discover Lands Unknown, where every game will be unique. Here, all the components will be, as I say, the, all the, the non-cards will be bespoke and hand-assembled from clearly uh, the designer's leftover cast-offs from other board games. And this is relevant because the mass of the different components will be relevant sometimes. Anyway, it's a bizarre stock game where you are you don't have companies but instead you had lots and the lots are of particular components and they're going to score at the end of the game if you have more components in one pile as opposed to another or if one pile is heavier or lighter than another honestly it's 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 so cute that I can't help but pledge for it uh, it was initially for Americans only which we find uh, prejudicial in the, in the extreme and now it has been opened up to Canadians so now we can recognize that it's still prejudicial in the extreme but prejudicial in a way that favors us so we're okay with it now and so that is lots. You can find it on the Kickstarter. I love it. I can't wait. <laughs> Finally, on, on Kickstarter, I, we have spoken before a couple of times about Flick Fleet, the marvelous uh, sci-fi fleet-based large ship systems management dexterity game where you flick dice and the die flick is both your shot to determine if you hit the target and also a die roll to determine if you hit the target. I'm a big fan of Flick Fleet. It's very expensive, but it's very expensive because much like lots, it is bespoke and it is hand assembled from laser cut acrylic ships with a lovely little laser etching to give details and the ship name on it if you go for the deluxe version. There have been a number of expansions and this latest Kickstarter is for a box of new expansion material. It can be a la carte, where you choose specific kinds of ships that you want, or you can get it all as a bundle. And I'm definitely in for a little bit at least, because this is a system that deserves to be supported. I'm a big fan. So if you're at all interested in getting involved in Flick Fleet, they do have copies of the base game available in this latest Kickstarter. And you can check it out on Kickstarter. This is Flick Fleet Box of Flicks 2. Although you can also get the first box of flicks kind of sort of with some Kickstarter exclusivity thrown in anyway. They're they're trying as per usual to please all the existing fans and, and supporters while at the same time being as accommodating to new fans. And of course, this being on the internet, no one will complain. Never. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now on to the topic of the week, which is whining. <sighs> but I don't want to talk about whining. What kind of whining? Oh, but I really wanted that piece. You took the one I wanted. But I don't want to terraform Mars. 
Don't take that one. Now my turn is ruined. But I wanted to be the start player. That's right. Pick on the guy that's in last place. But I wanted to be last player. If you explain the rules better, I wouldn't be losing now. Hey, look. Leave GMT alone, Walker. Good job, Kingmaker. But I wanted to play yellow. If you attack me now, I'm going to spend the whole game destroying you. And I'll make sure that you don't win. But I don't want to eat my vegetables. <laughs> Congrats on being the tryharder. You really nailed it. <laughs> Could I have one more turn? One that you don't ruin for me? <laughs> You're great at killing my units. And fun. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> I would just like to stress, before we go on, and this is absolutely something I acknowledge, not with any degree of pride, more or less everything that I talk about here and that I complain about, I have done. Some of them I do on the regular. Again, I'm not proud of this. It just is what it is. <laughs> and I'm are, trying to become a better person. And there are reasons why we do this sometimes. Well, I, always, I am also very guilty of this. It always feels justified in the moment. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would just like to... Uh, this is perhaps unfair, but s- such is life. Start off with the inspiration for this topic, which was indeed during the live stream of Root, when I think it was turn two, when Walker confidently declared, and it wasn't even in a whining tone of voice, it was with such confidence and certainty, and with such authority and definitive nature. It's like, well, I'm out of the game. And then the other two people at the table, namely myself and Huey, were like, well, here's three or four things you could do no, with a well, couple was, of actions to was, get yourself out of this particular minor conundrum in which you find yourself. <sighs> at which point you doubled in and said, no, 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 that's it. I'm just stating a fact. This is it. The game's over. I'm completely out of the game. Said the one who won the game. No, I, I, you I, I won the game. watched it. It didn't quite game. go out that way. But, but yeah, it was, it was not great. <laughs> yeah. I've definitely done that before as well. And I think this is honestly, and I'll return to this several times. At the end of the day, whether the game is fair or not, because sometimes there are legitimate causes for complaint over the course of a game, because either the game wasn't designed properly and it's unfair, or because other people are, in point of fact, behaving suboptimally and or unfairly. But at the end of the day, you have to stay flexible and acknowledge that maybe what you were planning to do isn't going to work out. Maybe it's not going to work out precisely the way you wanted it to. Maybe the dice are, have just decided that they're going to hate you and punish you for the entirety of the game. But you just got to stay flexible. Look at look at the ways out. True, but some games lean in lean into this. Like what we talk about where there's a heads-down game. Yes. Lots of Euro games where there's no interaction. There would be less of this because no one can interfere with what you're doing. Whereas some games where... Uh, People can do things where you like you could even miss your whole turn, or you've spent the whole game getting this combo ready, and someone does something that now that combo will be impossible to pull off for the whole game period. So you've wasted almost the entire game trying to do this, and now it's gone. Okay, well, with respect to building towards a combo, that I think directly feeds in, into what I was talking about. Don't put your all your eggs in one basket. Now, now some good games might allow you to do that. Maybe, but I would argue that that's poor play. And you have to acknowledge that if you're building everything towards this one unbeatable combo, well then, maybe you should acknowledge the possibility that it's not going to work out the way you wanted it to. Someone could be whining because uh, they're not playing the game they wanted to. They got forced into a game that they didn't want to play in the first place, so now they're already in a, in a, in a sour mood. Oh, good, good. Do I do that? No. Okay, okay, so. good. Because that, that, that is, ugh. oh, that's rough. Or maybe when someone gets lapped on the score track, that could, that could, <laughs> that could set them off. So I got I got to say that there's this running joke that Huey has that I think is very helpful at sort of deflating this idea and at least acknowledging and at least pointing out that there's a tendency to do this. Huey has this thing that he does and it gets me every time. The first time anyone scores and they move up on a score track. So, you know, at turn one of the game, the score is two to zero to zero. Huey will then say, they're winning, get him. And it's just a lovely little acknowledgement, I think. I, I think this is what he means by it. I've never interrogated him as, as the, the ultimate meaning of this crack. That maybe ganging up on the leader <laughs> or aggressive targeting isn't always justified just because we think that someone else has a momentary advantage. Now, I'm also wondering whether it's this whole whining thing is, is a good strategy. Right, to de- yeah. deflect the the aggression towards you and to keep a lead. Like, say you're in the lead and, you know, people are about to gain up on you and you can sort of play the, the, the timid sheep or, the, or the, the, poor, the poor person getting beat up upon and use it to your advantage. Is this, is this a legitimate strategy? Is this something that, you know... This, I think, is the intersection between game design and social dynamics. 
because there are some games by their very nature and by their very structure where whining is absolutely part of the game, either by intent or by accident. And I don't think that those games are by and large for me. Take, for example, and this is going to be somewhat controversial, a comparison between two games that are structurally very similar, Game of Thrones, either first or second edition, and something like Senji. In a Game of Thrones, where you don't really have anything to trade as a general rule, it's very much, at the end of the day, down to standard risk-type whining. It's like, don't attack me, attack somebody else. And then you get to engage in the classic whining debate strategy of who's actually in the lead. That's another element of game design, which I'm going to get back to in a little bit. If you contrast that with a game like Senji that says, look, we're going to make sure that the diplomacy is substantive. There are goods to be traded here. And I'm not, I'm not saying that any game where you a- have actual substantive goods to trade is automatically better than one where you don't. But I'm saying is, if you know by virtue of the way the game works that there's going to be politics that's necessarily internalized into the game, number one, I want who's actually willing to be relatively transparent. More on that in just a second. But number two... I would prefer if there be a little bit of tangible grit. Now, yeah, you got to monetize that stuff. Yeah. Now, th- there are some exceptions to this. Quantum, for example, is a game that doesn't do this at all. That's one of the reasons why when you play Quantum on Board Game Arena, it hilariously says, remember, second place is the first loser, so gang up on the winner and you better do that. But it's a 45 to 60 minute game with, with sp- cool spaceships that are flying around and wild combos. I'm okay with that. That's all right. But if it's going to be a two to three hour troops on a map game, and the only restriction on who to attack is who you think happens to be winning at the time of give me a break it's going to be a wine fest and i'm not there for well it's not it's it's not only that who's in the lead it's also well if you weaken me then it's going to strengthen him and it breaks down into this you know back and forth and 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 funny that you said that i'm just going to tie this in is the time is also an element as well because you know now you're invested for like three hours and if you feel as though you're out of the game or you're not you know, participating in the game anymore, then that's going to put you off as well. Right. I, I do think the worst example of this are bad troops on a map game, you know, with all the standard difficulties, A fights B and then C wins, and it's bash the leader at the worst of times. This is one of the reasons why I prefer something like Senji, where there's a little bit more substance to the diplomacy system, or like Kemet, where the, where the combat is transactional. I don't think I've ever... Heard anyone whine in a game of commit? Why are you attacking me? It's like, well, you were the juiciest target. Why else would I? I, I like, of course, I'm or, attacking. Or blood you. rage, right? Yes, good it, point. It's just straight up. It's like uh, this is happening, and we all either we all benefit or one. You know what I mean? It's right. Like, it's this like very interesting. Right. You, mechanism. Some, someone would have to have a very very poor understanding of the game state to engage in these kinds of shenanigans. On the other hand. When you compare things like to many of the substandard risk variants, I would argue Game of Thrones, you, you might not agree, or even a game like Quantum, but again, but it's kind of okay, it's 45 to 60 minutes, where it's like, well, you have the most points on the board. It's like, no, but if you knock me out here, then I'm not really in the lead, you see, because there are all these easy points on the ground. Or if it's a game where most of the score needs to be calculated ex post facto, if it's got a clear scoring system, that, that sometimes takes the bite out of it. But if it's all about you know, weird calculations about hidden points here and there, then whining tends to predominate. I'm not really in the lead. Someone else is in the lead. I don't find that enjoyable. So other than the leads, we have people who don't grasp how randomness works. (laughs) Yes. Complain about the dice or about random draw. And then... I've said this before, and I, I really think it's true. I think one of the best social skills that a gamer can do to just help diffuse the situation and help make sure everyone have a good time is just to sympathize with your opponent when they have a bad role. Especially if you don't know them. Maybe even when you do, it's like, oh, you can't, you cannot catch a break today, Walker, after, you know, a fistful of, of ones comes up or what have you. It makes everybody feel better, and it's not like it's going to hurt you in the game state. So just be a, show a little bit of magnanimity, and when, when your opponent makes an excellent roll, don't immediately jump down your throat. When you make a good roll, say, oof, sorry, that was, uh, that was rough on you. But like, now, sometimes we're smack talking, right? We're in the middle of the smack right. talk and we, we, we exclaim justice, but we know each other and we're familiar with the kind of thing. But there's, and this helps forestall the whining that I do all the time, where it's like, oh, the statistical average of my throws has been significantly <laughs> lower than the expected mean. It's also true. A lot of the reading that I did to prepare had a lot of awful stories, Mark. Oh, no. And I've never seen, I'm not going to go into any of these stories. I'm just saying that. I don't know. I'd be curious. 
in a, well, in a sort I, of I didn't, bizarrely I painful way. There is there was Game of Thrones one that was. I for one am shocked. That was very bad. Well, because you can eliminate someone in the first turn almost right, and then they sit there for three hours and not be able to do anything. But that being said. Uh, when you have a, a group that's been together for a while, this is usually not a problem. So this is, this usually uh, is highlighted on game nights when you go down to a gaming store and you're playing with all different people. What are those? I know, right? Or you're trying to start a new group, so you're inviting a bunch of new people in. Or, Why would you do that? Or you're, <laughs> I know, that's just asking for trouble. Can we get a COVID cave? Um, <laughs> and Or you're bringing like one new person into your group and you're just not sure exactly how they're going to interact. Right. Because you know, they interact with you fine, but you know, there's different chemistry between different people. So this is, this is how these problems arise. And sometimes, like you said, there's some ways to litigate this and you just have to remember that Someone might be just having a bad day. You don't know what their life is at home. You just have to give them a break maybe on the first time. And if it's like something that continues over and over again, then maybe just bring it to their attention. I have some stuff at the end, that other other ways, but moving on. Another thing that I think can help mitigate whining in a game, and I was thinking about games that are based almost purely on spite, but nonetheless work to... To smooth out, and, and I, I think a lot of the work of Jim Felly actually does a lot of this, and in particular, Door of the Lesser Houses, because Door of the Lesser Houses is very similar in a lot of ways to take to take that game. In fact, it's my preferred alternative to take that games. But there's a, enough hidden information in a game of Door of the Lesser Houses that you can imagine that somebody has a good reason for irrationally targeting somebody. If somebody goes after somebody in a game of Door of the Lesser Houses, even if I can't tell why, I might at least be able to speculate as to what secret goal they have in terms of the actual game mechanics that would motivate them to target one person mercilessly or refuse to retaliate against somebody. You know, all those behaviors that would drive me nuts in a game of a, sta- of, a, of, a of a mediocre or troops on a mad game. It's like, why are you not retaliating against this person? Why are you continuing to attack me when I've done nothing to aggress upon you? Endure at least any time I, I feel inclined to say that. It's like, oh yeah, you've got a hidden goal and I've got a hidden goal. Maybe I don't understand what's going on. Let's try to find out. Well, that's what I have here, like a rules misunderstanding. Eric, you don't understand a particular rule. Maybe you you know, you don't understand like the vibe of the game and people are attacking you all the time and you just don't get what's going on. Or or you've done a whole strategy thinking the rules work a certain way and now they don't and now you're into whine mode. <laughs> well, yeah, if you if if you're prompted to whining by virtue of not understanding how the game works, well then there's a problem. Or you, you misread the atmosphere. You've shown up to a gaming night and you're a very competitive person, but this is, for these people, it's just like a sort of hang out and have fun and you start, you know, or the other, mostly the other way around, maybe. You, you're there to have fun and these guys are super competitive and you're just like, like, whoa, you know, what's going on type thing. Yeah, I guess. Another way to fix it would be, uh, I read, this is a very interesting way to do it, is like just announce, like pre-game, say... You know, look, guys, you know, I, I tend to whine a lot. So can you just, you know, let me know if I start up and, you know, so I can quash it right away. And, and you know, that kind of thing. I thought that was a very interesting way to do it. And that maybe sort of like just puts a overall feel to the table. And, you know, so, you know, it's a back and forth between everybody. Yeah, it, it sounds kind of stilted, but at the same time, just acknowledging it. And this is one of the reasons why I suggested this is a topic, right? Just acknowledging your own proclivity towards a, I would argue, degenerate behavior can help you help remind yourself not to do it. <laughs> and so in addition to just being able to say, hey, people, you know, call me on my bad behavior, it can also just help you remind yourself that you're prone to it and to help you help encourage you to avoid it. Maybe I should start trying to do that. Walker, in the future. Will do. I'm, I'm prone to whining in games, Walker. <laughs> Got you. If you see me starting to whine, if you could smack me upside the head and start whining about my whining. Because that's the other thing. That, that, that's what my, I think one of my common recourses to someone whining is I start whining about their whining. This is not helpful. <laughs> this is not a grown-up approach to the situation. And uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's just a spiral of awfulness. That's right. That's and I should a, stop doing it. That's, a, that's, that's the, my next note. If the perpetrator is a particularly dense... And you just happen to do a podcast with them. You can su- suggest that you do a topic about whining, and maybe they can figure out that they're ruining game sessions with their shitty attitude. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it was just the other way around. What, what, what else? I mean, uh, rules, uh, things. Uh, sometimes people take it too personally. 
sometimes your expectations are too high. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously, the moment where you're inclined to undercut the social environment because of how well you're doing or not doing or how you're being treated at a board game, obviously, is someone who's taking the game too seriously. You know, there's no context in which being harassed or aggressed too strong in a game of Cthulhu Wars is not worth ruining the mood of the room over. <laughs> and the, I have another thing you can do. You can take it as a compliment, right? Because if people are picking on you because they think you're winning, then you must be doing well. <sighs> sure. That, that was the line that Dr. Stallone tried to tried to sell me. I remember started whining once. This was illuminating. This was actually a time where whining was, was somewhat advantageous because at least it brought something out to light. I'd, I'd observe that, that our friend Dr. Stallone in most games will target me whenever, regardless of who's advantageous to target, whether I have the most points to be taken, whether I'm in the lead, whether I'm not in the lead, whether I'm an easy target, whether I'm a hard target. He will attack me as a general rule of thumb. And I started whining about it. He says, well, you know, Mark, uh, anytime we play a game, I, I assume that you know it better than anyone else. And so I always attack you. Yeah. And guess what happens when you're not there, Mark? So yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah, maybe next time uh, he's in town and the three of us are, are or three of us plus more <laughs> are going to be playing a game where this kind of targeting is possible. I'll just sit out. Well, shunt. Or I, oh, I thought you were going to go somewhere else. I thought we were going to gang up on him and shunt him under the curb. Oh, well, that's a good idea too. <laughs> <laughs> we're on. It's on. <laughs> Unfortunately, he listens to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I've, I've been joking about it and. Obviously, it's 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 kind of funny because it's a juvenile behavior, but it can be really super toxic. And I know for a fact that I have caused people to not want to play games with me ever again. And so it's really been a bad exchange on my part, a momentary venting of my spleen versus permanently reducing the number of people I get to play games with. At a minimum, that's even setting aside whatever other social bonds i might be burning and torching for no good reason other than the fact that i've got a that, that, that i'm badly behaved and it's really a scourge like it, it's 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 amazing how quickly the mood of a room can go from we're all here having a good time regardless of what's happening on the board to this incredible chill yeah it suddenly becomes very quiet it's yeah it's really bad and i'm just i i I understand exactly why it happens, because as I say, it happens to me. There's this sense of deep unfairness that demands to be voiced. And if, if only you could get the people to understand. If only they could see things the way you saw exactly, things. Exactly. Yes. Then, then they would know, and in fact, that, you know, rectify the situation so you'll start having fun again. You know, I should probably have a button or something with a large label that says, get over yourself and just learn, <laughs> learn how to learn, learn to look at the button and just press it. Life, whenever I, whenever it, I feel like I'm being it's aggrieved. It's a little recording. Life is hard. <laughs> Life is hard. <laughs> it's a game, dummy. <laughs> it's a game, dummy. So yeah. So just like I said, make sure you just understand everyone's having a hard day. And could they could just be tired? They could be under stress. They may not always be like this. Wait, 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 wait. Other people's feelings matter? They do. Just not, gonna... when, just not when it comes to facts. <laughs> I'm going to have to sit on that one for a while, Walker. Th- th- thanks, for, uh, thanks for bringing this to my attention. So thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us to whine about anything you said, you can reach Walker via his email, just roll the dice at gmail.com. You can re- reach me, Mark Bigney, for all your non-whining on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. And you can find us on Patreon. Patrons get to whine. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. If you like the podcast, tell a friend. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>